Joaquin Walker. How are you doing? I'm good, Matthews. How are you? I'm really, really great. Thank you very much. So I, I was just waiting for 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 attendees to to join us. Mm -hmm. People who follow me, people who follow you, people who are willing to know more about human centered design and cognitive bias. And it's a pleasure to have you here. Now is the second international talk that I'm that I'm uh, having here in my Instagram. And as as you can see, my first talk started with uh, women from from Germany, from USA, and and then you're from Pakistan. So uh, crossing borders is really important for us. Yeah, multi multi background, multi knowledge. So thank you very much. Fantastic. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, Matthews, and thanks you for having me. Um, it's a very diversified audience, and I think it's a fantastic subject to talk about. I'm very passionate about it. So really looking forward to our conversation. Thank you very much, Rahil. So I'm going to introduce you, introduce you to, to, our, to our guests here in Instagram. Okay. Uh, guys, Rahil Wakar. He is the CEO and founder of White Rice, and he has been working the intersection between design and change, yeah, especially in social impact. I, I do I do have a, a a personal passion about this, so it's gonna be a, a nice talk today. He he's also working tackling some of the most wicked social problems by applying behavior science human-centered design, and system-level thinking. He's a certified behavior designer, design thinker, and a social impact strategist. He actively pursues opportunities aiming at behavior and social change by working closely with social enterprises, NGOs, and businesses. Rahil has helped massify impact for organizations like the European Commission, Oxfam, ICRC, John Hopkins, among others. He's also a recipient of the Australian Business Leadership Excellence Award and was selected as Asia's top 100 entrepreneurs under the age of 30s by the Foundation of Youth Social Entrepreneurship. So, of course, for me, for our audience here, it's a pleasure again to talk with you here. Yeah, here. And I would like to start talking a little bit about human centered design. When I started uh, learning a little bit about this, was in a massive open online courses from Acumen Foundation in 2014. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was pretty interesting because uh, some countries like Brazil, like Pakistan, uh, Indonesia, and, and Bangladesh, and others in Africa, we do have uh, some social problems inherent in our, in our culture, inherent in our uh, behaviors, inherent in our habits. And it's, it's pretty intense to know those problems and to use design to, to tackle those problems. So human-centered design as well, uh, design thinking or service design, where uh, they, they, they are great uh, methodologies, great frameworks to, to, to know and to understand the problems and as well to, to deliver some solutions. So I'd like to, to talk a little bit first, first of all, uh, with your perceptions, with your expertise, with your backgrounds in human-centered design, to just to, to, to understand a little bit more how you and White Rice uh, delivered some solutions, uh, knowing throughout empathy uh, the, the problem and then deliver uh, the prototyping, the ideation, and then converging and diverging throughout this, this methodology to, to create the solutions uh, that in the final stage deliver the, the, the final results. So thank you very much again. Uh, let's Let's hear, a, uh, let's hear a bit about your experiences and what have you done. Sure. All right, Matthew. So again, uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a pleasure being on your, um, on, on your podcast, on your videocast. Um, I think uh, 
for me, um, human centered design really means about means empathy. It really means um, going to the core and understanding who the user or your customer is. Um, and everything centers around them. So it's like, you know, when we use the term customer is the king, I think in our in our case, user is the king because everything we do is stems from 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 their life, from their perspective um, and from their viewpoint. And that's what we're really trying to understand. Um, I'll give you a little background to so First of all, White Rice, uh, the company that I founded like 14 years back, um, is really, we were a behavior design firm. And when I say behavior uh, design, I think the, the two words really clearly imply that there's something to do with behavior, uh, which is really around behavior change. And then there's a design side to it because we have to design the route for change. Um, so a lot of the work that we do at the end of the day results around understanding behaviors from a behavioral science perspective, from a cognitive perspective, and then understanding how design and design thinking and human design could actually create those interventions for change. Because the work that we at, at the end that we're interested with is to change behaviors, is to change perceptions, is to change mindsets uh, for the good. Um, most of our work is with the nonprofit, with the impact sector. So we, as you mentioned, we work with international NGOs, the UN, and usually they give us the, the most challenging problems to solve. You know, they say that, all right, um, uh, you know, mothers aren't breastfeeding, um, you know, children aren't, aren't taking the right diet, um, you know, there's, uh, the people aren't washing their hands uh, with soap, which is, I think, very important right now in, in the COVID circumstances as well. And everything around that is really around understanding how people operate, what's their mental model. So I think, you know, in, in a nutshell, if I look at the way we look at problems is the first layer um, of the lens that I would say is the cognitive lens, is to understand how people um, make decisions in the first place. What are their belief systems? How do they, um, uh, what are their unconscious, subconscious biases or, or how do they process things at, at, at that level? And once we understand those cognitive biases, we bring in the human-centered design lens where we use design research as a method to go deep and understand and get insights around why people have those biases, why people do behaviors in a certain way. Um, a lot of times we come across the challenge of this knowing doing gap where people know that there's a right behavior, that this is something that they, they should do, which is beneficial to them or something that they shouldn't do, but they still don't do it. Right. Um, and why does that gap exist? So I think the, the, Human-centered design side, the, the, the immersive part is really about understanding the context in which the behavior takes place. And the cognitive side, the cognitive biases, the behavioral science side, is to really understand how people operate, what's their operating system, what's their mental construct before when they, when they do things. And I think if you look at the phases based on those insights when we design prototypes, I think we're very cognizant of what the biases are. And how do we address that through the communication or the design or the intervention that we're doing? Um, how do we uh, make sure that we're addressing those biases that exist there? Um, so let me let me bring this to context. Um, let me give you an example that maybe, maybe you know, just, just gives you more in terms of substance of how we look at a problem. So I want to share a project that we did a couple of years back um, with the transgender community. And it was around the issue of uh, the spread of HIV, HIV AIDS. And, um, and there were certain practices that uh, really around um, 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 uh, safe sex, basically, because these are sex workers that we were working with, um, and there were practices that they weren't doing. Um, and HIV itself at that time was a, was a tabooed issue, uh, was an issue that people really don't want to talk about. And these are very closed-knit communities. And once you, are, um, you become a victim, you're out of that community because they're, they're very tight and tightly knit. And we had to really go in um, and, and we spent a couple of months, two to three months in their communities, in their context to really understand how those behaviors took place and why were those behaviors taking place in the first place. And as I pointed out, um, I think most of them knew the harms of catching HIV AIDS, right? Um, at that time, I think it was even um, uh, the, uh, the, the, there was that also that um, there's a challenge that people weren't getting um, the medication that was required. So they knew that this was eventually going to cause them, it could be, it could be death or they're actually out of that entire community. Um, so one of the interesting things that we did after those insights, um, we looked at certain biases and we said, how do we address that? Um, so as a result, what we, one of the biggest insight was that they didn't want to, want to hear a lecture. 
they weren't interested in someone coming in and talking to them about the issue. So one thing that we said, all right, how do we grab their attention? So the attention bias was one of our challenges. So we said, all right, let's convert our entire content and our story into an animated drama. So it actually became an edutainment based content where there was no concept of having a lecture or a, um, um, they were forced to, they were actually watching it out of entertainment. And what we also realized and another insight was that um, given their work schedules, they were really, um, um, they, they wanted entertainment, the, the few hours they had, they really wanted to be entertained. They would watch movies, they didn't want to be, you know, be, be been given um, new instructions. So based on that, I think the other challenge we looked at was that how do we grab their attention when um, the content is being played to them. And I think that's where we look at how do we create salience in the content? How do we create familiarity with what we're doing? So I still remember that the initial illustrations, the drawings that we did were very, uh, we showed people, uh, you know, these characters in, in clothing that was very normal. And I remember this feedback that someone immediately said, so we did a co-creation session where we invited them over and said, all right, this is what we're doing. What do you think about how, how would you we want to be represented in a situation like this. And they said, we're all about fashion. We're all about uh, makeup. And we're all about, you know, wearing fancy clothes and that they need to be shiny. They need to be glit glittered. Uh, they have to have that, uh, that buzz to it. And, and those are the insights that we start building on in terms of formulating the, the characters, the, the, uh, the type of feel that we want to create. And I think the other interesting thing um, that I just want to share over here is that what we also realized that they had their own script, they had their own language, so um, which was very personal, personalized to them and, um, and, and to the community. And what we did was that eventually all the content, the scripts that we wrote, we translated them into their language. So there was an immediate familiarity um, and a connection when they heard, heard, heard those words that they, they commonly use. And then at the next level, we even used the same people that we did research with as voiceover actors so that the voice resonated with the audience as well um, because they have a very particular type of pitch. So, you know, there, there are all these things that we try to create, um, bring in social proof into it, frame the conversation from a perspective that it's not about, we're not talking to you, we're talking about the community and we want your advice and your help. How would you help someone else? So in this entire process, what I just want to highlight is that it was a lot of back and forth. So it's a, it was like ideas that we would co-create, we would prototype at different stages, at the script level, at the um, illustrative level, um, even with the voiceovers. And we even wore them throughout the process. So there was a natural buy-in. So by the time when we released the content, there was already that, uh, that warmth for it. And the people that we, um, they were really against the, the idea of having, having to watch this actually became our biggest proponents. And they were the ones who were promoting and talking about it and sharing it with their circles that you must watch it. So I think, you know, understanding people and, under and when you design for them, um, as I said, when it's empathy based, I think you not only it's, it's a win win in terms of reaching your audience and getting that buy in, but I think it it just creates such more, much more value and there's much more ownership eventually of what, what's produced. So sorry for the long answer, but I just wanted to bring the entire context there. No, that, that's amazing. That's amazing and brings a, a talk about empathy because somehow empathy is like a, a, a struggling point to understand others because we have our own background, our own history uh, and our own place, like how we manage with, between situations is totally different from others. Like uh, even though we are twins, uh, we, might, we might face problems differently. So empathy, as, as, I, as I understand, as I also engage with, is to see more than see, is to observe others as well, listen carefully and practice those observing and listening activities. But more than this, uh, try to be one of them and try to create in synergy because one thing is to, oh, I have my, I have this, I, I understand the problem, I will create by myself without knowing how the people engage with these problems, like in slums in, in Africa or in places just like this with uh, transgenders in, in Pakistan or other places in the world. So I know the, the situation and how can I engage? And more in the second step is to create, uh, to deliver solutions, to create prototyping and 
I I I do I do agree that there are some prototyping that then have more like bright brighter eyes, like have more impact, just like doing payment or storytelling and they are more they they engaging more people because they 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 create this this uh this history this synergy between two parts yeah the parts who are trying to deliver the solution and other who who actually have this had the problem and and needs the, the 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 user or the solution that they are going to be delivered so it's really important and we do have a, a, a TED talk from Brené Brown, which is really impactful about empathy. And I do agree with her. And we do need to, to have more empathy in our lives and to understand these, these, these solutions and these problems as well to deliver the solution. In other words, we have the cognitive bias. And I would like to, to ask you about in this, in this situation, the pandemic situation, do you think the, the, the patterns, behaviors now, uh, we do have more biases uh, having uh, been applied from, from some niche, some people more than other in, in other times, just like confirmation biases or bandwagon biases in, in social influencers uh, uh, and, and fake news? What, what do you think about the digital world and then the world we are struggling with the pandemic situation? Um, so I think that it's a very relevant conversation. And um, very recently, there was this, uh, there was a nudge talk conference, which was all about nudges and how behavioral science can actually play a very important role in, in a pandemic time. Um, and I think the, this, the underlying theme is that um, everyone is processing, processing the situation differently, right? So based on our existing uh, biases um, and our existing mental models and constructs, we look at the situation very differently. There are, uh, like people in Pakistan, for example, uh, we are still facing a situation where um, our peak has just started. And, um, and, and the reason why we're in a very difficult situation is that we still have people who are denying that this is, this is a real problem. You know, there are still people who believe that it's not going to affect us. It's about um, old people. It's about the uh, it's about urban problem. It's an urban problem. It's about it's the rich man's problem. It's not the poor man's problem. And, you know, with with that type of mindset um, and then the, the belief systems that kick in um, that we have to die one day anyways, you know, so with all that type of, uh, I think, thinking that prevails. Um, it becomes very challenging um, to, to get the message across. And I, I, I honestly feel that even when, um, when the issue in, in the U.S. was still emerging, um, I remember that uh, you know, people like Donald Trump, when they came on, on camera uh, or on the screen, they were, were, I never saw him wearing a mask. Right. So the moment you see that, you know, that it's like a, it's, it's, it's a, you, that affirmation that the leader of the country doesn't feel that it's a, it's a big problem. It's OK. Then it isn't a big problem. And that's exactly the same thing that happened with our government, that most of our government officials didn't wear a mask till the situation became very worse. Um, so, you know, the things like those subtle cues that you send out um, and and things in terms of I think a lot of stuff is based on the conformity. You know, we want to conform with a particular um, a group. We, you know, there's that element of social proofing as well, where we want to be, we would follow what other people do. Uh, and I think that's where the, your influences really matter. The people who have the center stage, them talking about the conversation and them and they depicting the right behaviors becomes very important in giving those subtle cues for others to learn, all right, this is an important issue. This is something that we need to be very cognizant of and, and, and wary of. Um, I think there, there are different levels. So from our perspective, a lot of the work that we were doing um, had suddenly become digital. You know, we, the only way to reach out to people was through digital mediums using, um, you know, um, the Facebooks and the Twitters of this world and the, you know, the Instagrams of this world um, because we couldn't reach out to people directly anymore. A lot of our work used to be with frontline workers, which wasn't possible. And I think at that point for us to understand how behaviors are formed and adopt, adapted on the digital world became um, the, the new go-to area. And I think um, generally speaking, digital uh, media, digital marketing has 
um, there, there's already a lot of behavioral science and nudges being used um, in terms of, you know, anchoring and framing conversations and creating salience around, around issues. And I think it's, it's even more relevant now because people are just processing too much. And if we wait for system two to come into play and their, their rational side to think about the issue, I think it's going to be too late. So I think we um, have to design the context in a way that people without thinking too much are forming that behavior. That's why I think the, the reinforcing these behaviors in public is very important, um, especially around the hand washing and the social distancing, the mask. Is, is, it's, a, it's a very critical behavior. If 10 people, if you walk out, are wearing a mask, uh, 10, you know, out of 10, nine or eight are wearing, you immediately stand you know, different. And that is the first sign that you either need to adopt or you would be, you know, called to action. Why, 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 aren't you, why are you doing this type of behavior? Um, so I think, you know, the, 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 I think behavioral science and cognitive biases right now are more important than anything else um, because that is the front, first line of interaction um, which can be very quickly done. And if you understand if our policymakers and if the people who um, have the, the prerogative to make that change happen, if they start applying those principles in all their communication, I think it really starts, it can start sending out a, a very powerful message um, and the right type of cues that allow people to start um, thinking about that, all right, maybe this is the new norm. This is the new way of doing things. Um, and I think that is what we're doing. We need a new default. Our existing default was it's okay, uh, you know, our immunity would increase even if you don't wash your hands, it's good for playing, you know, all that. I think the new norm has to come in. And um, and that's where I think all these things really, really play a very important role. Yeah, it's just like praying the reset button, yeah? <laughs> like everything exactly. that we, we had before, now it's different times, different, uh, different problems, and we might focus on that problem, that pandemic is a situation, globally situation, and a global issue that we need to understand. Unfortunately, here in Brazil, it's just the same. The government uh, just don't don't care too much about this situation, and then the numbers are getting skyrocketing. It's getting booming uh, every day. More, more cases, more more uh, people dying. So unfortunately, we need to understand more. And I do, I do, I think, I think anchoring and and this kind of uh, informations, uh, if they are uh, misleading and misunderstood, I think it's totally bad for us, like uh, World Health Organization saying that uh, something today and then tomorrow they shift in the minds and then chloroquine is good and then now it's not so good. So uh, I think people, that's why education is really important. That's uh, information is really important. And then there is like a, a, a balance uh, pending from fake news to the, the, the news that uh, have this, the, this sure. The, the good and then the things that are they are pretty intense, massive, but we need to understand. And the others who are like people or governments or I don't know anybody else, uh, just uh, sending to to a huge amount of people saying something that's not really sure that is happening. So, sure. what do you think about anchoring in, in those days and people? really needs to understand the, the, the patterns and really needs to understand uh, where the, the information comes from because uh, fake news is struggling. And now, I don't know, I don't know in your place, but now here in Brazil, we are pretty close to the elections, the pools, so uh, municipalities. So it's like, <laughs> it's totally, it's totally a, a arm now, uh, information uh, used in, in social media. So. I would like to know more about your studies. What do you think? Because we are struggling with this situation, and I think it's really interesting to, to understand a little bit more about those biases, anchoring, confirmation, uh, somehow ostrich, ostrich bias as well, uh, negating some information. So what do you think about this? Sure. So I think it's, a, it's, it's uh, to be honest, I, I might not have the right answer, but I think the, the, the question is that and I don't think there's one right approach to it. I think there, this is this is a space where we have to experiment, where we have to try things, be bold enough to try things and see what works, build up on what works and continue just keep doing it. Um, I think one thing that, um, as you talked about, one thing that's very important in this entire conversation is that being cognizant of the biases we have 
is I think is a very important aspect of addressing this issue itself. Like for example, um, fake news, let's take fake news. Um, if you believe that um, the, the virus can't do anything to you and it's not your problem, and if that's your confirmation bias, and then, then you'll seek information to validate that, right? You'll seek information that says that wearing masks doesn't really make such a big difference. You know, um, you'll seek the information that, that's there. And I think pointing that out, that, um, that and sometimes, you know, it's also called um, being vulnerable, that, all right, the information that I'm sharing with you might change tomorrow. I don't have the right answers, but here is what we believe so far. And this is what we've seen over time. These are maybe the three things that really work. I also see that there is a cognitive overload with information, right? We're getting so many messages from WhatsApp, from digital media, from our friends, from our grandmother. There's just all this information that, gets, that comes to us. And this, it becomes that choice paradox as well. Like, what do I choose? What do I do? And I think that's where simplifying the behaviors is very important. We need to focus on a few things and do them consistently rather than saying, all right, you need to do 20 things. So for example, if I look at the behaviors that right now I see that are saving people, the first thing is just, just close yourself. Just don't go out, right? That is the most um, powerful thing that you could do. If you can avoid going out, you're saving yourself from so many other things. And the family around you, people who are around you, if you can make sure that people stay at home and they're not exposing themselves to the virus, you're already doing your job. So as a citizen, as a government, I think that's the one very clear message that needs to come out there. I think the other thing is the, the two or three behaviors around wearing a mask if you have to go out, making sure that you're washing your hands with soap constantly, and making sure that even if you have to go out, you maintain that distance. Um, these are, I think, if we can simplify and say, right, these are four or five things that you just need to do. And you do need to ensure that not only that you're doing it, but you're making other people follow it. So that ability, um, and once you transfer that onus to people, I think what you're doing is that you're creating that, um, that, that national call that, all right, these are the things we expect from you. Um, rest, the government is there that, that's going to try and help and do whatever they possibly can. But as citizens, as something that you could do for someone else, um, this is what you, you need to do. So one of the challenges that I see is that a lot of people sitting at home right now feel helpless. So a lot of times the conversations we're having with people is um, we want to do something, but we can't do. You know, it's such a challenging time that we want to help someone out, but we can't do it. And one of the conversations that I had with, 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 with my team is that um, I think the best thing that they can do is just keep themselves safe, you know, just protect them themselves from others, right? If they just do that, that's the biggest job that they can do. So I think, you know, yeah. reinforcing the fact that um, at this point, what uh, belief systems prevail um, and what needs to happen at an individual level, simple things, simple behaviors, and keep reminding them. It has to be so repetitive. And as you said, if you constantly receive new information every day, with that overload, um, cognitive overload, you will not be able to apply anything into the work you're doing. But it's like, you know, Matthew, if you're getting five messages every single day, that keeps reinforcing. Those are triggers. Those are reminders, nudges that constantly remind you, all right, this is what I need to do. This is the, the basic that I need to do. And this is what I need to conform with. I think the one or two other things I just want to point out is I think the, the aspect of authority bias, for example, um, who's saying what is really important in this case. If as a nation, if all your, um, all, all the people who influence you, either it's celebrities, it's the media, it's the, the government, whoever it is, if there is a unified message across the board um, or the doctors, the healthcare staff, that I think would really help as well. Again, with governments like ours, um, even in the US, um, the challenge that you see is that you get so many divergent messages. You know, every day someone else is saying something else. Even the politicians and, and your go top government officials are changing the narrative, as you said. You know, they, they have one verdict today and they have another tomorrow. WHO is, I think, is also um, has that challenge. And, and, and if, because everyone's looking up to WHO, their role has become very important because they just can't say the wrong thing, you know, because someone's going to take it. And then, you know, they can't negate it later on. No, no, we didn't mean that. We meant that because by that time, people have already processed and started using it. So I think there's, there's a lot of um, aspects to it. 
But I think at the core, um, I think the, the part that you said in, ter in terms of anchoring the first message that is out there, the repetition of that message, and that message coming from every single person, the same message being repeated, I think was, is really important to at least create that harmony and create that new, no you know, when you're forming a new behavior, it brings that consistent message and the new wiring becomes very, very clear. Yeah, and, and that's, that's how and that's why understanding humanity and society, uh, like studying a little bit about psychology, a little bit about sociology, a little bit about humans uh, as a whole, is really important because we start as individuals and then we can go in uh, spreading, uh, the message is spreading how we, we act as a group and then becoming this uh, society that we, we, we think that is complex, but it's always simple that we turn on complex. Yeah. So uh, I think, I think human-centered design is also those shift of mindset that we need to have, uh, which, is, which is to understand the problem, not always trying to deliver a complex solution, but as simple as we can, and then trying to uh, going forward with feedbacks and then the, the, the looping, the, the solution looping always going and back, going and back. Rahir? 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 Yeah. Yeah. Come back. So I, I was just seeing talking about uh, the way we need to understand the, the, the solutions, not only as a complex thinking, because sometimes uh, startups or some companies always wanting to, to have a, a, a complex solution. But for me, I think that the, the simple as we can have is the best. So the simple, the best. And we are just performing better and better throughout the, the feedbacks that we are having with our customers, our users. So based on the human-centered design, uh, shifting a little bit uh, the, the themes, I would like to, to hear more about the, the projects that, you, that you've done. It was really interesting to understand a little bit about the transgender project. But, but show, show to our audience, show to, to me a little bit the, the, the complex thinking that we are performing in, in white rice and how how we can uh, perform better in, in this empathy process starting from discovery and then uh, ideating and delivering right um, so, so let me um, let, let me give another example of a project that we were involved in which would hopefully give you a bigger understanding of how we get involved I think one thing about our work is that it's 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 very systemic so we work on projects that one are at, at a larger scale. Um, number two, we're really trying to change behaviors at um, um, at the bottom of the pyramid. So we're really talking about people who, um, you know, are are in in very tough tough circumstances, usually in poverty. Um, and on top of that, we want them to change behaviors. We want them to do, um, you know, do the right behaviors, to perform the right, um, you know, the right actions that would help them in the long run. Um, so, so let me let me talk about a project that I'm really passionate about, um, which is on the issue of child stunting. Um, so, what child stunting basically means is um, the child not being able to grow mentally and physically in the early ages. So, it's basically the age till two, uh, which we also call the first one thousand days, which is from pregnant, you know, when when a child's in a in a mother's womb, to the age of two, and that's a very critical age because um, science says that ninety percent of your behaviors are formed, uh, sorry, 90% of your brain is formed by the age of two. Um, and whatever gaps are left because of no proper, no proper nutrition or hygiene, um, those are like irrecoverable losses. And in countries like Pakistan, um, you know, where we have 43% of our kids are stunted, um, which, which vary at a different scale, so from minimum to, to maximum, but that's a, still a big number. So we were tasked to do a project. Uh, we were working with UNICEF. Um, we were working with 90,000 mothers directly and around 26,000 uh, 26, sorry, directly and 90,000 indirectly. And the task that we had was that how do we get certain behaviors across that become part of 
the, uh, the their lifestyle become part of the way they look uh, and they approach the issue of uh, of their child's growth, especially in the earlier days. Um, so we uh, naturally, uh, you know, we started by understanding what the bias is, where were the biases that exist. Um, I think one of the biggest challenge we had was the existing prevailing beliefs, which are really entrenched in the fact that, uh, you know, small things from the first milk, you know, uh, which we call clustrum, um, mothers usually wasted that milk, saying that it is actually, it's milk that has gone spoiled. And now we know from science that it is also called the golden milk because it's the most nutritious, the most beneficial thing a child can have. Um, so there are things like these myths and, um, and, and prevailing circumstances that we had to address. And that's where we then went in. Uh, we spent a couple of months um, doing design research and uh, we did uh, things like day long observation. So our people would go into the into houses um, and become their guests and, and become a guest in a way that they wouldn't go actively seeking and, and telling them what we're observing, but really becoming part of their family. And, you know, it took us some of our observations were like seven, eight hours long. And the point that I'm trying to make is that um, when you really want to become part and really understand the context in which people behave and why they do what they do, um, you really need to embed yourself into their lifestyle. It won't happen by these, you know, by one hour interview or it won't happen by them, you know, asking them questions and they tell you why. Because people don't sometimes even know why they do a certain thing. Um, so, you know, what was in very interesting in certain cases that I think 70 percent of the people that we had talked to said that we do wash our hands with, uh, with soap. We do get our, wash our hands, our kids' hands with soap. But when we observed those practices, it was quite the contrary, right? You know, if, even if it happened maybe once a day, we, we realized that the way they, they related to those, those, those behaviors was that some, a lot of people said that, all right, once we wash our hands in the morning with soap, we're done. We're, our hands are protected. We don't need to wash it again. Um, then what we saw is that at critical moments when they were eating food, mostly they would forget washing their hands with soap. You know, so things like these that when you see in the context and then on top of it, you understand, all right, why is that happening? Is it an ability problem? Is it a motivation problem? Is it a problem where they don't, they're not reminded of that behavior because there's so many other things that are moving around? And based on those insights, um, we came back and our teams basically brainstormed and we ideated and we came up with multiple uh, low fidelity prototypes um, where we designed communications uh, material, which, which could range from posters, um, from these short stories, uh, from games, uh, from interactive sessions, which we then went out and you know, did role play. So we actually demonstrated, we did a session with them using those materials. And then we would see the response from them. We would see what, how, what would resonate, what would the recall be from that message? Um, what thing um, hit them at, at a certain level where they would say, all right, this is something that I now feel that I can, I can clearly understand and go back and apply. And based on those insights, you know, we designed a complete behavior change campaign, which was an intervention around um, uh, multiple touch points where Primarily, we were working with the frontline worker who had these one-on-one -on -one interaction sessions with these communities. And one, one thing that was very interesting, Matthew, in that entire process was that we changed that monologue to a conversation and which was empathy-based. Empathy so the first thing that they would go in when they would ask a, a, a mother that they would meet is, how was their day? How was their last week? What was it like? What were the challenges they faced? And when they would open up and say, all right, we had a particular problem feeding our child because of these reasons, then they would come in with a message and they would say, all right, um, we might have a solution. We might, um, you know, let, let's figure it out together. And then they would use the resources we gave. So it became, it, the conversation became about them, not about the, the, the frontline worker and their agenda and their, their, their session that they had to deliver. And then, you know, at, at, a, at a higher level, I think what we were able to do is um, we created these mother clubs. And again, the idea was to create a social, uh, create social proof around um, what we were trying to do. And these clubs were where mothers and mother-in-laws would really come in and they could have an open discussion, a candid discussion about the challenges they were facing. They could also learn from positive deviants, people who are already doing it in the same context and how are they doing it. And I think the other interesting thing that we were trying to do with this is uh, we created these emotional demos, um, which, uh, which we call emo demos. And the idea was to make the, the problem large, you know, come to life and experiential. So like one of the examples I'll give you that we would put uh, glitter on, on, on we invite two, two participants, two mothers, and we would put glitter on their hands. 
And then we would say, all right, one washes it with soap and the other doesn't wash it with soap. So naturally, the one didn't wash with soap had glitter left on her hands. And then we said, all right, now you need to go to the audience and shake your hand with someone else. Some people would shy away. Some people would do it. Um, and then you would see the glitter transfer on someone else. And then we said, all right, keep that loop repeating. And that was a great way of showing that that's how uh, the germs operate on your hand, right? You can't see them. But once they're there, uh, they keep transferring when you meet more people. Similarly, we, we use this exercise where we had two bags and we put uh, milk in one bag. And the other bag, we put milk and we put in some biscuits and some chips and, you know, some junk food. And then we would show them visibly that this is your child's tummy. Imagine this is your child's tummy. One has um, milk in it and one has all the other rubbish stuff. Which one do you really want to give to your child? So, you know, making the problem realistic enough that they could immediately relate to, I think, really um, broke down those existing beliefs, their, their biases around um, 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 the, the assumptions that they had. And also, um, I think we, we also, the other thing we tried to do was use anchoring in a lot of our things where we would start with storytelling. And the first story would, we would start with was a story of a, ch of a mother who was about to lose a child because of practices that sh she was doing wrong. And so that we immediately got their attention and they were all ears to us. And then when we started narrating our conversations or content, they were already hooked on to what we were talking about. Um, and as I said, I think, you know, Matthews, we, this entire process was iterative. You know, we, we went through many design rounds, uh, many co-creation rounds where we involved the, the actual mothers, the users, the different types of influencers so that we got their feedback. And, as, and, and, and then we piloted the entire intervention. We actually went into a three-month ro three rollout where we um, rolled this out in certain areas and saw the impact, uh, what worked, and we did a lot of real-time monitoring, um, seeing every day what's working, what's not working, and tinkering the program. It, we didn't left it, you know, leave it on its own that it's just going to operate and you know, things will happen one day. And based on those insights, then we were able to design a program that was foolproof to an extent that it had gone through several iterations and several learning cycles. And now at least what we have is something that our frontline workers were comfortable with and had built in enough confidence and my, you know, mileage in terms of the work that they were doing that now they were confident to take it to scale. So that's um, uh, you know, uh, just an example of how we apply different sides of human-centered design as well as the cognitive biases. And I think they go hand in hand. I wouldn't say that um, you know, one, 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 uh, you would do them in isolation because at the end of the day, if you want to change behaviors, we have to do it at both levels, at the cognitive level and at the context level, because the behavior is performed in an environment. You know, it's, it's not done in isolation. So we need, need to understand where the behavior is going to be performed so that we know how to condition that behavior and make it uh, easy enough and make it, uh, you know, attractive enough that people want to do the behavior that we're trying to subscribe into. That's, that's really interesting. And there is no... Uh, the best or the worst, yeah? There is not right or wrong. There is conditions that you apply and to understand the problem. But the, I, I, do, I do love your talk because uh, somehow we need to create this confidence. And it's not, uh, it's, it, seems, it seems easy, but somehow it's like an iceberg, yeah? Sometimes right. we just see the, the, the top, but the, the bottom is totally... Uh, somehow it's a secret, it's a Pandora, Pandora treasure. So we need to understand to, to get the, the, the key and to open to, oh, now I can see as a whole situation. And throughout observation, throughout uh, empathy, as we talk throughout the ethnographic uh, methodologies, uh, interviews, observing, listening, I think uh, it's totally how to understand the problem, but how to eliminate the word obvious in your mind, because somehow we, we see, we talk, oh, this is obvious for me, but it's not, not for me, for them, for the entire group, for the entire problem. And somehow as humans, I think, uh, as we try to, to manage the, the solution, we always, somehow, we always have this, this uh, word in our, in our mind. Oh, this is obvious. So trying to eliminate, trying to advance into this world with our minds, we can deliver better uh, solutions and create more confident talk, more confident uh, places. 
and right. create this this confidence with your with your uh, engaging partner, engaging uh, group, engaging system. So uh, it's it's totally it's it's incredible to understand how you manage the the situations and how do you deliver uh, this kind of solutions because we can talk a little bit uh, this uh, this situation somehow. We see just a little bit of the iceberg, but there is a plenty of situations happening and how we can discover more, even sure. more about this, these problems. One thing, Matthews, I just want to bring in, I think um, it's, it's, as you said, um, as a designer, as a design thinker, I think design thinking uh, more than the tools is a mindset, right? It's an approach. It's a way of how you think and how you look at stuff. And that's why it's called design thinking, right? It's not called design alone. It's it's the way you think about a problem. And I think the uh, there, there's a lot of um, you know preconceived assumptions. I think even as designers, design researchers, design thinkers, we have our own biases, right? Um, and it's it's and have to have that check that. Uh, you, that inclination to go with a certain type of idea because we've done it in the past. It works for us in the past. The inclination to say that, all right, I've worked with these type of people and they think like this and um, and it could be the contrary if if you don't. So I think that's where the beginner's mindset is very important. Um, and that, that openness, that open-mindedness that um, you're open for anything. You know, it could be any any revealing insight because I also feel that the, the most revealing insights come at the last it. You know, as you said, the iceberg, it really comes at the point where you literally are about to give up and you said, all right, I've got all my insights. And the moment you are about to wrap up, there's something phenomenal that happens that completely shatters all your beliefs. It completely changes all the entire assumptions that you went in or what you saw there, because there was that moment in time, which was the moment of proof that this is how it really happens. This is how it really takes place. So one example that I just wanted, another example I just want to quote from the same, um, um, the child stunting project, is that I think even when we're designing communication, we, we, we get the insights, but we spend, or sometimes we invest very little time in the actual creative process because we assume that these people or these the, the bottom of the pyramid people, um, they uh, they don't have any aspirations. They will go with anything. You know, it's anything will work for them because you know they're already underprivileged. But I think that's another fallacy that we realized because I in in, in the most work that I've done over the last two decades, I've seen that sometimes there are even higher aspirations with these marginalized communities because they are already underprivileged. They don't have a lot of stuff. So for them, their dreams are full of aspirations because they, they, that's what the world they live in. They, dream, they live in a world that's full of dreams. And if you are able to match the aspirations, um, there's just you can take them to the next level. So just to give you an example, when we were looking at the design side, so when we were doing these group sessions, we actually did an exercise in research where we said uh, to these mothers to draw out an ideal mother for them. What would she look like? What, she, what, she, what, what would she wear? What type of um, a setting would she be in? And it was fascinating because they were basically, we had a uh, facilitator and they would keep telling, add this to it, add this to it, add this to it. And then we said, all right, what type of content do you watch? And we saw that there was a lot of inspiration from Indian movies, you know, Bollywood movies and, um, and the actors in that. So there was a particular female uh, actor that the community that we were talking to, uh, they really resonated with them and, you know, with this character. So what we did, Matthews, is that we really, uh, you know, we, we looked, looked at her features and we incorporated her features into the illustrations that we were designing. So that when they looked at our content, they felt good about it. They could see a lady and they say, all right, this is who I want to be. I don't want to be that, um, you know, that, that average looking lady that's out there. I really want to be like her. And to be like her, this, these are the things that she's doing. And this is what I should be following. You know, so there's sometimes small things, they look like small things, but these core insights really change the entire narrative around what you're trying to do. And, and as I just, just, just to, to conclude the, the conversation, I think what I'm just trying to point out is that the attention is in the detail, right? The attention is, you know, it's like the devil's in the detail. It's the insight for me is in the detail. It's really hidden somewhere in that and you just need to un un unravel it through these different methods. And once you peed it like, like an onion, um, there's something that's staring in your face 
which says, all right, this is what, if this is what I do, I can immediately get, get the intention that I'm really looking for. So I think all these things really, really matter. Um, as, as you said, it's a, it's a systemic thing. It's not getting one thing right. It's getting all the moving parts and moving pieces right together to make that, that move, shift in that needle or that move, movement you are creating. Yeah, that's awesome. That's why we need to, to focus in, in imagining or, or, or observing or looking or, or our mindset as a child or as a tourist because everything is new and then we are managing this, this mindset to deliver the best solutions. Really impressive. Rahil, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are reaching the, the final uh, of our talk. I would like to, to ask, uh, as the other talks that I had, to ask you about something, the dropping message that you need to, to deliver to our audience and to inspire us and some, something that really uh, happens to your experience, that you read a book, that you watch a movie, or a sentence that was said to from a person that you, you like it. So please share to us our final thoughts about this whole talk and those kind of uh, informations to inspire us. Sure. Um, so, so Matthews, again, I think... Um... When you bring it down to one, it becomes very difficult because there are so many things that have inspired you over time um, at that moment. Um, but I think uh, one thing that I really want to quote um, from Rumi, um, the famous poet, uh, the Sufi poet, um, is, is a saying that I think really resonated with me very earlier on, and it still does. Um, and it's the saying that what you seek is seeking you. And I think it's very powerful because um, it, it, for me, it really means that the moment you focus and the moment you realize what you want to do, um, that thing is going to make, it's, it's going to make sure that it comes in front of you. And, and, you know, as, as Paulo Coelho in, in, in The Alchemist also talks about, um, you know, the, the universe conspires to make it happen, you know, when, once, once you, you set your eyes to it. I think that's what I believe has, has really pushed me um, and has formed the course of what I do. Um, and, and, and I've been able to really find my passion and my purpose together in the work that I do. Um, and that's why I love what I do. Um, and I've been doing it for the last two, two decades. Um, and, I can, and, I, and I envision continue doing this because I think at the end of the day, I really want to change lives. And this is a fantastic way to do it. I think it's, this is the best way I could ever do it. Um, so, so I think my, my last message would be um, find, your, find your passion. What, what is something that makes you come alive and once you start seeking it um, it'll start seeking you you know it'll just come to you um, so just just be patient just hang in there and keep doing it and it'll happen one day amazing thank you very much Rahir. please thank share you. your your social media well, where so, where our audience can can deliver a message to you can can follow your your activities your your work Sure. So um, I, I've got my LinkedIn um, account. I'll, I'll just share that. You can follow me on that. Um, I'm not very active on Facebook, but I have a Facebook account and I'm also on Twitter. So what I'll do is I'll just in the comment bar, I'll just put in my, my Twitter handle and in my LinkedIn profile and please follow me and please reach out. I'll also send my email. Thank you very much once again. Uh, it was amazing talk. It was an impressive class with you and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care.